Okay, I want to preface before we go to our guest here with just some basic history. Uh, in mainline Roman history, and you learn that Julius Caesar's family actually got political power through this over several generations, fire departments were set up in the big city of Rome, and if your neighborhood did not pay them the fire department fee, they would set fires and burn down your neighborhood. And over time, it grew into a protection racket. The Sicilian Mafia in the last 200 years in Italy and the United States, in places like uh, New York and Boston and other places, didn't invent coming to your grocery store or your laundry or your restaurant or your church and saying, you need to pay us protection money or somebody's going to burn down your grocery store. I'm not saying who's going to do it. But if you pay me a little protection money and hire my cousin, he'll watch out and make sure nobody burns down your grocery store. And, of course, it's the cousin smiling at you from behind the capo that's going to burn down your grocery store. There was a case of this in New York. I don't know. It was a decade ago. got a lot of attention, so I use it as an example, where somebody with ball-peen hammers knocked out hundreds of car windows for years. And folks noticed that there were billboards everywhere for a company that had shops all over the areas that would fix your windshield for the lowest price. And finally, it was discovered when one of the workers blew the whistle that he had upwards of eight people going out every night knocking dings and windshields with a ball-peen hammer. Now, that's a false flag, business attack. Uh, there's been a lot of evidence that major virus companies are hiring hackers to release viruses that they then already have the fix to. Uh, I mean, this really is, is common sense. Governments in the West the last hundred years have made drugs illegal because uh, the big uh, powerful interests control the drugs being brought in. Now they can shut down their competition with the law they've bought off, and they can make larger profits because it's now a black market item. This is all really just cause and effect, common sense. Hitler firebombing his own Reichstag, that's now been released and confirmed. Hitler blowing up his own military base, blaming it on uh, the Poles to attack Poland uh, and say, oh, look, the Poles attacked our base, our communications base. They even dressed up prisoners and shot them in Polish uniforms and German uniforms to show newsreels of dead bodies. That's how World War II started. That's publicly admitted. So the point is, you know governments do this. You know Gulf of Tonkin was staged to get us into Vietnam saying our ships were attacked. And they said it was a conspiracy theory for 40 years. When on the 40th anniversary, the CIA declassified, they staged it. Uh, we already knew because officers on the ships came back uh, and uh, reported, no, we weren't attacked. That was in the San Diego paper back in 64. But it, but it becomes a rumor, a, a legend. People heard it was staged. Well, later it came out it was staged. Uh, and, and there's Operation Gladio, over 200 U.S. bombings carried out with NATO in Europe. Their favorite thing was to blow up school buses because that really got folks upset. And they would grab a patsy, shoot him in the head, and say that you know they had uh, committed the bombing of the school bus. So it's time to grow up. The Russians do it. The Czars did it before the communists. Uh, every major government does this. And, and the argument in the Pentagon is others are doing it. We got to do it. You got uh, Operation Northwoods where the Pentagon proposed to Kennedy to blow up D.C., bomb Miami, hijack jets by remote control, crash them, blame it on the Russians, start World War III. Kennedy said no, and they said, well, then we're going to just take you out. Uh, now, all of that goes on. All of that is happening. And, and, you know, I've talked a lot about this because it was in Newsweek, it was in major newspapers that the hijackers were trained at U.S. bases. And it came out, but was never discussed again. And the head of the Defense Language School, Colonel Butler, went public and said, this is, some of these guys were at our school. I recognize them. Something's going on. The government's behind this. And then they started a court-martial against him, and he shut up, and they dropped the court-martial. So all of that said, I wanted to play this clip before we go to our guest from England for the rest of the hour, and we appreciate his courage in going public and losing his job over this. Uh, and I actually have some of the local papers that reported on it here, but bombshells, Saudi and U.S. government protected hijackers. And of course, I mean, who set up Al-Qaeda? Saudi Arabia, the U.S., England, and Israel, along with Pakistan intelligence in 1979. Zbigniew Brzezinski has written two books in the last five years bragging about it. Uh, and uh, it's the same groups working together. We've had Mr. Springman, the former head of the visa section of the embassy on, uh, where they were ordered. It's been in the Toronto Star. I had him on nine years ago. But I've had him on since. Mr. Springman, I talked to his colleagues. They were ordered to let Muhammad Atta and others back into the U.S. 
what, eight months before 9-11, even though they were flagged as terrorists in their database, and, and, and the CIA, when they wouldn't let them in, had the State Department call and say, look, they work for us, that's a cover. The underwear bomber, Under Secretary of State Kennedy admits they were ordered to help get him on the plane by an unnamed U.S. agency and to give them the visa. We knew it a month and a half before because our listeners, lawyers, uh, the Haskells, husband and wife lawyers, were on and saw the guy being got on the plane, thought it was suspicious, didn't have his passport, saw the whole firecracker deal, right as they roll out. I mean, it's all staged. Uh, now, now, uh, the, the Fast and Furious, shipping guns in to the drug dealers to then blame it on the Second Amendment. Now they've announced the gun control because of their own operation. It's happening. I mean, they know what they're doing. And, and so it's time to grow up and realize this is happening. Now, here is a former uh, governor of Florida, uh, former uh, Senator and Florida Governor Bob Graham, said at least two of the purported 9-11 hijackers had assistance from Saudi Arabia. Graham's recently released novel, Keys to the Kingdom, implicates the Saudi. He told MSNBC uh, the novel is based on factual information. Let's go ahead and play that clip from MSNBC. Well, just briefly, Thomas, there are some unquestioned facts that Saudi Arabia was providing significant assistance to at least two of the 19 hijackers living in San Diego. The mm -hmm. questions are why was Saudi Arabia doing this? W was it also providing assistance to the other 17 hijackers? And then why did the United States go to such lengths, including censuring uh, the congressional inquiries report uh, on the events leading up to 9-11? that related to the role of Saudi Arabia. So there are a lot of unanswered questions, and Keys to the Kingdom starts with finding those answers. If you say that 40% of what's in this book is fact, okay, you think there that we it's going to allow for avenues of discussion? Oh, that's good. All right, now we are going to our guest, uh, Tony Farrell, served as a high-level intelligence analyst for South Yorkshire Police in Britain. From 98 to 2010, in the days preceding the fifth anniversary of the 7-7 bombings, Pharrell discovered the 9-11 attacks and 7-7 attacks were acts of state-sponsored terror. And Jaron gave me a more detailed uh, bio on him. He has a university degree in applied statistics, Sheffield Hallam University, if I'm reading that right. Postgraduate degree in criminal intelligence, uh, analytics uh, and analysis, Manchester University. Postgrad degree, management studies, Sheffield uh, and we continue uh, on from there, uh, studying future threats. And he was the head of the South Yorkshire Police uh, of uh, their program to analyze uh, terror attacks and uh, threats. Uh, and he joins us now, former intelligence analyst. And I have some of the uh, news articles here dealing with it. Police intelligence analyst fired for blowing whistle on false flag terror. Strategic threat assessment matrix concluded 7-7 was an inside job. Tony Farrell uh, is our guest uh, going over that. Um, and we also have mainstream British reports where they admit that most of the IRA bombings were actually run by British intelligence and British Army officers, some of which we've interviewed here. One of them got killed after he was on the show. Not trying to scare folks, just telling you this is not a game. Uh, Mr. Farrell, thank you for joining us and thank you for your courage. Thank you, Alex, and it's a pleasure to be on. So uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, you, your years of research, and what brought you uh, to going public with this information, and what uh, the, the, the police department uh, thought when you brought them this information. Well, I've been working for the police service for, uh, as a principal analyst since 1998, and had local government experience, and also worked uh, for the regional um, government office, which is part of the home office, uh, doing research into crime. So I was quite experienced as a civilian. I wasn't a police officer. And um, I was used to doing the strategic work. I wasn't privy to the detailed terrorist information from Special Branch, but I did take an overview of the sanitized versions and pull them together in a strategic vet. That was my assignment, my annual assignment. And um, what happened, Alex, was that, uh, as you say, a week up to... Uh, leading up to the 2010 July the 7th uh, five-year anniversary, I was merely going along with my assignment, believing that I was just going to be able to complete it without any problems. And um, unfortunately uh, for me, uh, running concurrently, it was my home study that was into things like the history of geopolitics and what was going on in the world and a bit of church history. Um, and all of a sudden, with a week to go, Alex, I dropped on... Uh, through the likes of your program, um, the possibility of 9-11 being an inside job, that quickly uh, 
triggered me to do a lot of research um, in, in haste at home, and hoping to get reassurance that that wouldn't be the case. And unfortunately, it was, as, as I could see, it was you know damning evidence. I panicked. I went to my church minister to say what they were doing in this situation, and he, he just said, "Well, terrible, isn't it? Have you thought about checking out Seven Seven? But I thought, "Oh dear, I better check that out too." And now we're only talking two or three days to go before the assignment's due. So I took a day's annual leave and uh, did everything possible. Uh, stayed awake for 24 hours. That too wasn't long before. It was so obvious, Alex, that it was an inside job as well. Uh, there's just damning information out there. And that threw me in a problem, Alex, because I had to go to uh, the, uh, the, the, what we call the, an intelligence strategy management board on the 8th of July. Um, and, it, and part of the assignment was a, a threat assessment that covered terrorism. And the component part would normally expect me to go along with all the government rhetoric and narrative on this, which would be to say that the threat, the large threat, was essentially from Islamic terrorism. Well, I'm sorry, um, if, if 9-11 was an inside job and 7-7 was an inside job, how could it possibly rely upon government r rhetoric? to actually say that it was Islamic terrorists as the biggest threat. Because All right, Mr. Farrell, Mr. Farrell, quick break, stay right there. Uh, absolutely, these are the big attacks. These are causing the large numbers of death. If that's an inside job, then you do the statistical analysis, then, then the government-sponsored terror is the most dangerous. We'll continue with where this led on the other side. So for 12 years, for the big city government and for the central government, of the Home Office, the UK, he's an analyst looking at future terror threats, analyzing where the terror threat comes from. Well, if you're actually a real researcher, you would know that there was BBC, London Telegraph, I've got all the articles, uh, police seize files of spy link to IRA murders. Uh, it goes on and on. Double agent was the real IRA's Omaha bomb team. And I've had these guys on. And hidden in all these articles, because they report on it, but they bury it, it turns out that 7 out of 10 IRA commanders, going back 50 years, on average, were British intelligence, staging terror attacks as a pretext to stay in Northern Ireland and to take the rights of Brits, now the most surveilled people on Earth. But, but side issue, the point is, is that this stuff's all hidden in plain view. Now, Tony Farrell, their chief analyst, uh, you know, just a week or so out from this big report, he, in his research, he, he, he finds reality. And what happened when you brought them the report, sir? Please continue. Well, the first thing I did, Alex, when this, this horrible uh, realization occurred to me, I thought that uh, um, I had to go and alert management. And I did that, Alex, with a briefing note, because we were getting very close to the deadline. This was the 6th of July. The deadline was required on the 8th of July. So I... I, I made it um, my business to alert management. It is shocking. I shot them uh, with a briefing note uh, that gave all the hyperlinks. So I, I alerted them to your 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 films. I alerted them to loose change and the, video, the compelling videos that were out there. That was on 9/11 and all. Likewise with 7/7, the research, the compelling research. And I was saying to management, look, it's a case of Houston. We've got a problem here. And uh, we need to have a look at it because things aren't the way they seem. And um, that, that shocked management. Um, and they really, on the 7th of July, they really sort of tried to wrap me up in cock, con socks, of Alex, and tried me to get a, a, a go along with it and not ro rock the boat and go to the Intelligence Strategy Management Board on the 8th, disregarding what I believe to be the threat and just carry on as normal. Um, I'd done all the work, uh, so I was in a position where I could have actually carried out and handed over the assignment to their satisfaction. They'd have loved that. My problem was it would go against my conscience. And quite frankly, Alex, um, this was a case I couldn't keep silent on. Silence, uh, you know, is, 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 you know is, it's not golden, it's yellow. And I wasn't going to be cowardly over this. I had to make a stance. It was a defining moment on the fifth anniversary, that 7th of July, 2010, I came to that decision in my own conscience that I must make the stand. And on the 8th of July, I went in and made my stance and refused to hand over the product that they wanted later on for that afternoon's presentation to the Intelligence Strategy Management Board. 
I was asked then to explain myself in a report. I was sent home, um, away from the office, uh, where they did an audit of my computer. And uh, I was asked to come back in a few days' time with a report that explained why I felt necessary to make the stand, which I duly did. I, I told them all the reasons. I made inferences on the strategic threat to do with the New World Order. And I made inferences that, yes, 9-11 was an inside job, 7-7 was an inside job, there was media control, and the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan are unjustified and morally wrong, and they're, they're for the purposes of furthering the New World Order satanic agenda. And, uh, of course, that didn't go down well, but it, it was a report that didn't pull any punches. And I simply said, look, I cannot go against conscience. Uh, the Ninth Commandment, uh, I'm a Christian, the Ninth Commandment says, Thou shalt not bear false witness. And I think that uh, the, my assessment was that this wasn't done, as Tony Blair blurted out, 7-7 wasn't done in the name of Islam. This was done to blame Islam uh, by Tony Blair. And I wasn't going to be a false witness and do anything that would perpetuate, a countenance the perpetuation of that lie. So I stood firm. I went on annual leave for three weeks while management decided what on earth to do with this. They held some conferences in my absence. I was very quickly told that there would be a, a, a hearing, that I wouldn't be a, uh, in the office ever again. Uh, so I appeared on, uh, at the hearing on the 2nd of September. They asked me, uh, had I changed my opinion on any of this? I hadn't. In fact, my opinion, you know, in a time off, I'd researched even more and my opinions had become stronger. So I was utterly convinced now, uh, no doubt whatsoever, that it was right to make the stand. They felt that my beliefs were incompatible with their role. Um, in some respect, I agree with them in the context that... Uh, so, uh, Tony, Tony, stay there. Could I just... Well, uh, yeah, that was a short segment, long 18-minute segment coming up with uh, the, the chief terror threat analyst who was fired over this. Stay with us. Ladies and gentlemen, it has been the naivete of the public in the West that has allowed unspeakable corruption to take deep, deep root into every sector of our society. Only facing the hard facts gives us any chance to turn the tide and then ultimately reverse what's happened to our civilization. Corruption either gets worse or it gets better. It doesn't stand in one place. And right now, it is, it is, it was slowing because of an awakening. Now the system is steamrolling. They are releasing every trick in the book to overwhelm us right now using psychological warfare principles. We are being bum rushed right now. We are under a full, no holds bar, 100% commitment assault. They're getting ready for even bigger wars, false flags. You can see all the preparatory brainwashing going on. Now's the time to pray, but also take action. Now, we're going to go back to our guest here in just a moment. If you go to the Drudge Report, drudgereport.com, we've also got this stuff up at infowars.com and prisonplanet.com, but nobody knows how to present the idiocy uh, of the establishment like Matt Drudge. <laughs> and... Uh, Joseph Curl and all the other great folks over there at DrudgeReport.com. Bernanke, gold, not money. <laughs> it's actually a video clip. I didn't know what Deb was talking about earlier because I hadn't seen this. I just saw it during the break. Uh, we're going to be playing that next hour, and i got some guests in studio where, where Ron Paul talks about dollar devaluation and how QE3 is going to de uh, cause more inflation. And Bernanke says there's no inflation. <laughs> it's like saying the sky isn't blue or the sun doesn't come up in the morning. And uh, Bernanke goes on and tells Paul, gold is not money. Federal Reserve notes are money. And then if you scroll down on Drudge, he's got Bernanke announcing that they may launch QE3, uh, which is a Weimar Republic-style uh, inflation. Uh, so, uh, meanwhile, the depression's so bad, there's copper thieves running around robbing. Crime is exploding, but uh, the government says everything is wonderful. We're going back to our valiant guest to break down his view of 9-11 and 7-7 from a... Uh, criminologist and statisticians uh, uh, expert of you and, and, and what evidence uh, showed him that these were blaring uh, inside jobs. Gee, I think the hijackers trained at U.S. bases admitted, but nobody investigates that. I think that might be a little place to start, but we're going to talk to him here uh, in just a moment.
Uh, Tony Farrell served as the Yorkshire Police 12 years as their chief intelligence analyst for future terror threats. He has, what, three degrees in criminology and statistics. Uh, and the point here is, is that he was following this big report on future threats and said, well, uh, th there does show there's some Muslim terrorists. But the big threat is, is, is government-sponsored. Here's my evidence. They said, we don't want to see that. It's not compatible with our narrative. So, so I mean, you, you hire analysts to give you what the threat is. And even upon the threat of being fired, does he want to change your mind? And he said, no, I do not uh, you know, renounce my Christianity. So they said, well, we're going to politically burn you at the stake and fired him. You'd gotten up to that point. Continue, sir, and what's happened since, why you're now going public. And then let's break down 7-7 and 9-11 from your expert perspective. Right, well, uh, yeah. it's interesting, Alex, because the way they actually uh, dismissed me, it, it was quite bizarre. It was a solemn occasion. They uh, they dismissed me not for my incompatible beliefs, so that made my position untenable. untenable. There was no allegation here of any misconduct. Um, so they, they, they almost encouraged me to appeal. Uh, so in one sense, they said, look, there's a, an appeals process to the police authority appeal, appeals committee, that's not the chief constable, that's the politicians and independent members of the police authority. That will be in front of the panel. So I, um, I mean, always said I probably wouldn't appeal. Uh, they seem to want me to appeal, so uh, I took them up on the offer. I appealed, um, but it did me no good because they still dis 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 dismissed me um, in, on the 26th of November, uh, which left me four days to get this into an employment tribunal. Uh, I'd been to my lawyers at that stage, and they said that this might be, you know, your beliefs may be protected uh, under certain law, so they may have acted unlawfully. It depends, but it's worth a try. And they're, they're in the employment bracket, religious and belief regulations from 2003. So there was a potential discrimination case here, and also under the human rights legislation, there was a potential unfair dismissal. So I um, put it into an employment tribunal uh, situation. And um, that's running, that's ongoing at the moment. It's quite interesting. We've had um, um, a pre-hearing review uh, to discuss whether it is a discrimination case. Uh, at that pre-hearing review a couple of weeks ago, or say a couple of months ago, the decision was that my beliefs were not protected. But there isn't a grounds for an appeal. In any case, the, 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 I can go forward on an unfair dismissal. And there's a three-day three -day hearing set aside or the, uh, I believe it's the 7th, 8th and 9th of September, uh, a substantive hearing. But the key for me, I think, is, and the key strategy for all of this, is to keep the actual belief, um, the discussion about the belief in court. So I fully intend, if I can, to launch an appeal. My barrister thinks that there are, there are grounds for appeal here, so we can mount a legal challenge in court, which will be an interim hearing, but again, that will keep on the agenda the issues of the, uh, my beliefs about the, false, the notion of false flag um, in terms of, uh, you know, and the satanic new world order in terms of a religious belief and a philosophical belief. Well, first and, off, uh, sir, I mean, just to add here, this is modern heresy for you to get fired when you're hired to analyze what groups are really behind the terrorism and try to track where the future threats are coming from. I mean, here in the U.S., we have Fast and Furious, where for two years, the Attorney General directed the FBI, DEA, and ATF to ship high-powered weapons into Mexico to then blame it on the Second Amendment. And even though this has all come out, they've now come out with the anti-gun uh, moves using the event that they are admitted to have triggered. So they're going on like nothing happened. But So it's not heresy to know that governments have staged events against their own people as a pretext to get control. That is in the Encyclopedia Britannica. That is a known fact. We have WikiLeaks three years ago releasing army manuals in the U.S. where they train army captains and special ops how to stage a false flag. You know, if you're uh, in a third world area and, and overwhelmed, stage a massacre and then blame it on the enemy. That'll force and multiply the people to help you. And the argument here is an ancient 3,000-year-old Persian gambit, of course, in chess to sacrifice a pawn 
or another piece in an opening move to make your enemy miscalculate and draw them in, a sacrifice. That's why the military does this, because they say, well, if we send in 100 troops, that'll draw the enemy out. The 100 troops will be killed, but then we'll see the enemy's strength. We can then cut them off at a pincer, saving 10,000 troops. It's a cold-blooded calculation, so that's, that's why they do this. They see Islam as a threat. They want to take over the oil and resources. They want to invade these countries. So, of course, they're going to stage some events. They call it a, a justifiable sacrifice. That's the sick mindset. But to say we're conspiracy theorists or we're crazy because we know governments admittedly do this, it doesn't hold water. That's right, Alex. And in times, you mentioned George Orwell there, and in times of universal defeat, Telling the truth becomes a revolutionary act, I'm afraid. It does. So continuing now, you're, 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 uh, you're challenging all of this, but what about the fact that you're an analyst and they're not letting you give, uh, give your terror threat uh, uh, prognosis? That, that also sounds like a national security issue, that, uh, that they're not letting you get your report out about who the terrorists are. Well, that's right. I offered, uh, I offered to provide them a comprehensive report, not just a, a, I mean, this strategic threat assessment matrix was a rather crude and simplistic, and, and I believe it's gimmicky. It's a distraction, Alex, uh, and, I'm, and, I, and I'm afraid that I, I think all the principal intelligence analysts in each of the 43 police forces in England and Wales, it's they that want sacking if they don't stand up and say this is no good. It's, it, it's a massive distraction from actually doing intelligence analysis. And in, I'm afraid, Alex, it's intelli intelligence analyst isn't, you know, if you're an intelligence analyst, you're not a spin doctor. And I'm afraid I wasn't prepared to be uh, a spin doctor in this instance. And I just wish that others would stand up and um, look outside now. And I hope by doing this that other analysts, will, uh, news will break to other analysts that they've got to do this. And we're, we have to have a pure role um, and tell it as it is without courting fear or favour. Well, and, Tony, uh, that's Tony, that's a great point you raise. We know in England now, the former head of MI6 has admitted it. We know the White House and Downing Street memo show it. It's confirmed that Tony Blair and George Bush got together in 10 Downing Street and at the White House on two occasions and ordered their intelligence chiefs to fix intelligence around weapons of mass destruction, including nuclear, in Iraq. Tony Blair responded with the 45-minute speech. Uh, um... Powell responded with the anthrax vial, and they did all of this. And now we know they went in to MI6 and to the CIA and ordered the analysts to issue false reports. Both countries' uh, analysts, in, um, including Dr. David Kelly, refused. And so, of course, they killed Kelly. Uh, and now we know that they created the Office of Special Plans, fake analysts, to create fake reports. So this is, this is a major scandal uh, that they're telling you to basically fix intelligence uh, analysis for them. I think that's even bigger than, quote, them saying, we're going after you for your beliefs. Or, uh, I, I mean, do you see where I'm going with this? Absolutely. And I wasn't going to bow down to their sacred cows. I wasn't going to bow down to their Caesar because I serve something greater than that, and that's my, my God. And, and my conscience simply wouldn't allow me to go along with this monstrous lie, and uh, I just couldn't do it. Um, and that's what led me to get the sack. And uh, I'm afraid if they're actually exerting that kind of pressure on other analysts, um, well, they're not, if they want to be uh, a have a conscience, then they're going to have to get the sack unless this is blown open. And I feel as though we, we, there's a chink here in the armour, Alex. I think you know the, the British police force, they can be put under pressure here uh, if we can just get, get this publicised more. And, you know, it takes one, I've done it, let's, you know, other police, there's good people in the police service, and, uh, you know, they could start to come out now, and that's what I really do hope will happen. Well, they better, because of this, the, the corrupt banks that run England and the U.S. and Europe are going to continue to stage terror attacks uh, if we don't. Now, now continuing here, um, looking at 7-7, looking at 9-11, look at Sybil Edmonds, she's an FBI translator, translating NSA communiques. She testifies in the 9-11 Commission in closed doors that she heard the leaders of Al-Qaeda on the phone with the CIA being directed in the year leading up to the day of 9-11 in sex slaves, weapons, uh, drugs, laundered cash. Of course, we know Al-Qaeda was created by our own government, so that makes sense. 
and she tries to bring that to her supervisors and is told to shut up. So, so there's not an analyst. There's somebody listening to all of this going on, and there's hundreds and hundreds of other people uh, who who have who have seen and witnessed the same thing. Uh, let's look at seven seven first. Uh, of course, the seven seven bombings in London, for those that don't remember, used to sell the Iraq War and more. Uh, break down the big blaring issues with that, sir. Right. Okay. Well, uh, seventh of July, two thousand and five, and um, London bombings went off, and there were three underground stations, and uh, a bomb that went off on Tavistock Square. Uh, now, um, few things that happened, and um, fifty-two people were killed, plus four others, which was the alleged suicide bombers. Now, there was no inquiry into who committed the crime. Tony Blair uh, immediately said that there would be uh, an inquiry would be a ludicrous diversion. That's enough a disgrace. And instead, we've been told who is guilty, and we've had instead, we've had an in, a diversionary inquiry l l later on down the line just about the intelligence failures, where the real agenda is simply to conceal the truth, as you say, you know, just as it was in the Hutton inquiry for Dr. David Kelly. Now, there was a poor quality and anonymous official version of the London bombings, and that's deeply un uh, suspicious and unacceptable. And um, add to that, there's, there's never been the proper inquiry, so you've got big problems there, Alex. And for the government to give us one narrative of 7-7 without allowing all the other competing narratives to be officially heard in the process, it's simply insulting, it's a disgrace. Now, a key thing here is the, um, the mock terror exercise that occurred. Now, this is fantastic, this. Um, Peter Power, advisor consultant, um, when all the bombs go off, shortly afterwards, we're talking an hour or so after the bombs have gone off, this guy, Peter Power, advisor consultant, goes on TV and announces this. He says that uh, this is amazing. We, we, the, 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 the terror attack, the, the terror training drill that we are into at the moment, where there's a thousand staff involved, has actually was simulating bombs going off at the exact same stations and location as it actually happened. Now, in statistical terms, Alex, it's as certain as certain can be that a drill exercise matches the exact same locations and dates of the actual bombs. That could not have occurred by mere coincidence. Now, was that investigated? No. Should it have been? Well, you're damn right it should. That, that and by the way, we're going to break. we got two more offers, segments. offers the insight that's needed to find out really what happened. And it's a, it's a disgrace that it... All right, stay there, sir. We got to go to break, and we're going to come back and let you finish on that. We got one little segment in that first five minutes of the hour, then we got guests coming in. We'll definitely have to have you back up in the future just to go over your own research. But absolutely, they ran drills on 9 11. Oklahoma City, they always run a drill to cover the real attack. You know, a lot of people engage in delusional, magical thinking. They think that you can just decide there aren't false flag terror attacks. I mean, you, you, you read the history of France and England fighting with each other and others. They were constantly doing it. Constantly doing dirty tricks against each other. Blowing up an ammo dump and then blaming it on the other. This is war. The issue is war is now being used against us domestically by our own governments. That's an act of war shipping tens of thousands of firearms into Mexico then blame it on the Second Amendment. And it's admitted the government did that. Okay, people, we need to grow up or they're going to keep using this tool. So this is a short five-minute segment, sir. we got one more little five-minute segment, and we'll have to have you back. But continuing talking to Tony Farrell, who was uh, in his police department and also worked in the federal government as a top terror analyst, ran into all this false flag history and information. You, you, you'd gotten into the drills of 7-7, the exact same bus, exact same place, exact same time, exact same trains, exact same place, exact same plot time. Actuaries have been done. It's in the thousands of tractagillions. That's, you know, billions of times all the sand grains in the world. It's nearing infinity. Uh, I mean, it's the equivalent of finding a unicorn, a leprechaun, and Santa Claus in your backyard uh, jumping rope. It doesn't exist, uh, but uh, please continue. Yeah, the uh, spineless, anonymous Home Office uh, official version, uh, that had uh, flaws in it that uh, subsequently the government had to admit that there were lies. The 740 ghost train that uh, 
went from London to um, St Pancras that the uh, Patsies were supposed to be on, but they didn't catch because the train never ran, and that was only an independent researcher that found that out later on and uh, shamed the government. Uh, when they had to change it, but they couldn't get the story to fit. So that, that, that whole sort of patch of the report is ludicrous. And, of course, why run the drill? Well, you've got some young Arab gentlemen who are working, you know, with the government, who are teachers and things, they're taking part in a patriotic anti-terror drill. Uh-oh, something's going to happen. Yeah. And then, I, Alex, I'm afraid, I, uh, the, the, you know, at least one or two of those, uh, you know, uh, passes were, were taken out and assassinated at Canary Wharf is the most plausible explanation. I certainly don't believe they were on the trains. Or, and the military try, uh, style explosives on the trains um, a far more plausible explanation than the um, so-called uh, explosions on the uh, in the back package is that uh, they self-detonated themselves uh, in wonderful synchrony. So um, all of that seems totally ludicrous. The, the profiles of these bombers, uh, the personification of these people was not such that these were going to uh, commit suicide. And if they've got videos that purport that they were uh, I actually believe that was part of a training drill. So there's so many things wrong with it. And I think um, we look at the G8 summit on the day of Glen Eagles and uh, what on earth was Tony Blair doing uh, a few hours later, coming on record when the police hadn't uh, had announced that we don't know who's done this yet, but Tony Blair does. He knows this is being done in the name of Islam. Um, now, I think that is a disgrace. I think that is unacceptable. But I wish just good people in the UK would actually see it because I think they're blind. Well, it gets worse. People. At the uh, Tavistock Institute bus bombing, it turns out there were people with fake bandages on who were seen before and then after with them off, you know, covering their whole faces, being bandaged up. They even, I mean, this was, this was off the charts, uh, insane and uh, openly, openly staged. And uh, the reason they had to admit they were doing drills is because people who were part of the drill then start questioning what happened, but by seeing an authority figure admit the drill, then they think it's all out in the open. That's why Larry Silverstein admits they blew up Building 7. We'll be right back. Well, we got Matthew Medina and Cody Hess, great political activist, uh, with a lot of news joining us coming up the next segment. They've also brought a friend along, um, Miss French. But we're going to be... Um, Talking more in the future with Tony Farrell. He's got a website going up soon. He's going to be publishing stuff as like, you know, an open source analyst for the people. We also need to support him uh, in what he's doing there in Airstrip One. Uh, Tony, you were making the point during the break to myself. You've been out for a week now, or five, six days, and no mainstream media uh, in England. You would think this would be newsworthy that a head analyst at a police department, a guy who was an analyst for the central government, the Home Office, comes out with this and that they're staying quiet. They don't want folks to look into this. Uh, on a, a lot of truth websites all over the world, uh, in, in a remarkably short space of time, following the, uh, the interview I did with on rich, richplanet.com, um, and I point out, Alex, there's an over, you know, people don't have to take my word for it. They can Google, they can search the web, and there's some fantastic analysis. The big picture 7-7, seven, seven, the ripple effect. Uh, seeds of deconstruction. All these documentaries are so superior to the government version, and people need to make their own mind up. They need to start looking because it, there's utterly compelling evidence that makes the government version ludicrous. And we've had a recent inquiry, Alex, as you know, uh, uh, to look at intelligence failures, Lady Justice Hallett. And um, don't take my analysis, I've not gone into too much detail on that, but. There's a chap called Nick Collistrum who's done de who, who, who stayed every day at the inquiry and has done detailed analysis that completely discredits uh, the whole of that inquiry. And uh, that needs to be seen and needs to be heard because that inquiry never allowed any searching questions to be asked. Why not? Um, and there's counter-narrative, there's narrative, there's analysis that ruins the inquiry's verdict. And if that's the case, We've got corruption in the court, too, I'm afraid. And the, the people, there were certain witnesses aren't being allowed to call, so it's all biased. So where do you go? We've got to get a breakthrough to mainstream media. We've got to get the public alerted, because I'm afraid, Alex, it's a bit like you say it is in America. People are just blind to it, 
and they turn a blind eye and they're cowardly and they need to wake up. Uh, it's hard as it may seem, but uh, we can't keep silent any longer. And uh, we need to put pressure, through my court case, we can put pressure on one police force. You know, we can, the court, this is potentially one means to, to really put pressure on the government. So I think, Alex, there's going to be a, move, a truth movement behind the progression of my court case. Um, and that might help. Yeah, it might help put a good pressure on, because uh, certainly 9-11 and 7-7 will be discussed in the court. At the pre-hearing review, we touched on 9-11. And the, my beliefs on 9-11, you know, similar to yours, but the judge thought they were absurd, right? And he's on record as saying that. So um, we've got absurd beliefs, Alex, um, but we've got the real beliefs, I believe, is the gist of it. So that needs to be in the public domain, and we need to get the people to look at it. All right. Well, Tony Farrell, we just appreciate your courage and the fact that, uh, you know, you could have just gone along with the official story and not lost your job. You've done a lot more than most people would ever even think about doing, and it's going to be men and women of conscience who do stand up and at least have the courage to speak out against the lies uh, that are going to turn the tide against this evil. I mean, all the lies about WMDs, the fake intelligence, the other stage terror attacks that have been declassified. Uh, if you've got groups that have done this before, and they have the motive, and they stand to gain, and only they can carry it out and a SWAT, the supposed head of the bombings, it turns out is MI6. I mean, even Fox News and Associated Press have covered that. This stuff comes out, and then nothing's ever done, and then you and analysts go, look at all this information, and they say, you're fired. Uh, I mean, it's, it's incredible. Mr. Farrell, thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to talking to you again in the future. We'll have you back as a criminologist to really walk through all of this, not just your case, in the near future. Godspeed. Thank you, Alex. God bless. Thank you, sir. We've got guests coming in studio, coming up. Stay with us. Ask yourselves, what are you doing in this time of great challenge? What are you doing to unlock minds?